invitation and um, we are happy to have you partner with us on this journey. I'm Andrea Oakwood, proud to be superintendent in Livonia Public Schools. And we have planned for you what we hope is a really informative evening based on feedback from our parents, feedback from our staff. And we want you to know, first and foremost, that your children mean the world to us. So we have assembled a number of presenters here this evening who I'm going to introduce to you. We have three segments of the evening, so I'm going to introduce our presenters for each of those segments. I'll have them stand, and I'll ask you to hold your applause until we have uh, worked through all of them. The first section of the evening we have tonight is entitled, We Prepare. For that portion of the evening, um, we will begin with Mr. Steve Archibald, our assistant superintendent, John Raymond, our LPS administrator for security, our Livonia police chief, Kirk Cade, Westland police officer, Joe Reardon. They will be our presenters this evening, and we are also pleased to have members of the Livonia police department, including one of our school resource officers here with us this evening. So let's give all of them a warm welcome and round of applause. on what we've entitled, We Are Aware. One of the things that uh, parents have shared with us is a desire to learn more about social media, the apps that are out there, some, some ways that they can help monitor and be more involved in that um, portion of their students' lives. And so toward that end, we have invited Principal of Holmes Middle School, Mr. Eric Stromberg, if you'll please stand. David Mitchell, Holmes Middle School teacher, Stevenson hockey coach, and LPS parent. And Detective Sergeant Wade Higgison from the Livonia Police Department. Finally, in our last section, entitled We Care, we're going to highlight the resources available to our students within the schools, and also resources available to our parents. And so we have student assistance providers, Denny Hines from Stevenson High School, Emily Emily Goslow from Franklin High School and Lisa Wilson from Churchill High School. We also have one of our elementary support teachers, Ms. Jennifer Wilson from Randolph Elementary. You know, a hallmark of our LPS community is a sense of pride and community spirit that we have and an ability to work together and a desire to support one another. Uh, toward that end, I'd like to thank members of our Board of Education who are here with us uh, this evening. We have President Mark Johnson and Vice President Colleen Burton, if you'll please stand. <laughs> our board is steadfast in, our, in their support of our students, our schools, and our community, and we are grateful for that each and every day. We are also very pleased to have our um, former esteemed superintendent, Dr. Randy Leopo, who is now our Wayne County Recent Superintendent, overseeing all 33 of our school districts in Wayne County. Dr. Leopo, thank you for being with us. <laughs> so finally, a little bit about this evening. In the next eight minutes or so, we're going to share a lot of great information with you. After the presentation, members of our cabinet team, so our district administrative team, you'll see on uh, flanking both sides of the auditorium, looking very official. Wait, wait. All of us will be here. We'll be happy to stick around as will a number of our presenters. If you have questions, please uh, feel free to stay after. We also have a number of resource providers who will be in the lobby area of the PAC when our presentations are done. Uh, you have a white bag with you. In that bag, you will find a ticket, so don't lose track of that ticket. At the end of the evening, uh, we have some uh, wonderful family-friendly door prizes, and so we'll be sharing those with folks in the audience as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Steve Archibald, and we're going to get the first section of our presentation entitled, We Prepare, Starting. Thank you. Part of my... Good evening. Welcome, and again, thank you for, for coming this evening. Travel safe.
I'd sing. What you'll see on the screen there, uh, to, as, as Andrea alluded to, uh, your child's safety is paramount to the work that we do here. Uh, certainly we're a school district, we're about learning, but we know that our students cannot learn um, unless there is the right environment. And uh, this is a simple statement from uh, our shared vision, which is also reflected in our collective commitments, but that we provide a, a safe, joyful, welcoming environment for all who enter and a place where students uh, are eager to learn. And in our collective commitments, it also states that where our students are eager to come to school, where our staff is eager to work, and where our community is eager to visit. Uh, and again, this is paramount uh, to the work that we do. Uh, you may recall from our community that uh, you were gracious enough to pass a bond issue in 2013. Uh, what you see on the screen are a list of inf infrastructure uh, safety enhancements that uh, have been uh, put into place using those ones from the bond. The safety and security throughout the district and those enhancements were an essential element of the bond. Uh, Mr. Raymond is gonna go through these uh, in greater detail and explaining them. Uh, but again, quickly just going through the, some of these, the secure vestibules at the main entrances uh, of each of our schools, which provide for a controlled access point into our, uh, to our buildings, our updated security camera system uh, throughout the district inside and outside of our building. A new security camera system on all of our, LP buses, our LPS buses. Uh, that's upwards of two or three cameras uh, on each bus with various angles uh, and recording capabilities. Uh, we have a, a school-age child care program and uh, now we allow folks, those folks who have access starting this fall, welcome them in a system with a car strike system for them to get in and out and to be able to access their child that way as opposed to having to just leave a door uh, unlocked or unattended. Um, was the ball spot getting? <laughs> Either that or I'm off the stage, I'm not sure which. Uh, our upgraded uh, mobile two-way radio system uh, that is district-wide, it's used for communications uh, within each of our buildings. A number of staff have those radios and, and communicate and respond to uh, situations, but those Radio, two-way radios also provide an opportunity for us to communicate with one another throughout the triad uh, or even throughout the district, um, in addition to our cell phones, of course. Uh, we have egress windows uh, as a result of the construction work uh, or exits in all of our classrooms, updated door hardware, um, and again, Mr. Raymond will talk more specifically about that, uh, and again, an updated phone system with the 911 emergency geolocator capability. Um, in the past, Prior to this system being implemented, uh, if we called 911 from one of our schools, it, it would not give the location. Now there's pinpoint accuracy to where, not only what building, but what room within a building um, for our uh, emergency response folks uh, to go to. Um, so again, those are just some of the enhancements that Mr. Raymond will speak uh, in greater detail, um, but again, provided to the 2013. Some of the personnel that we have in place, and you'll see at the bottom a very important figure or significant figure, we spend over a million dollars uh, in personnel costs related to safety and security. Uh, one of those is our LPS Administrator for Public Safety. Um, that's Mr. Raymond, and you'll get to hear from him and a little bit of his credentials. Uh, we've had officer, liaison officers with the Livonia Police Department going back to 1999. So this isn't only the response to some of the recent things that have gone on in schools, uh, but we started back with Officer Jim King at, at Churchill High School back in the late 90s, um, and now have liaison officers uh, servicing uh, our district uh, each and every day. Uh, back in 2012, we started an employee point, a security company called Blue Line. Uh, this is a, a number of um, retired uh, or uh, live or current, thank you, live. Thank you. Um, retired or uh, active uh, police officers um, or other uh, trained individuals that, that provide security throughout our, our buildings and at our events. Uh, we provide an extensive amount of crowd control for many of our major uh, sporting events, dances, um, and, and the like. 
We have a long-standing partnership with the Livonia and Westland Police Departments. And I can tell you as someone who's worked in this district as a teacher and as an administrator and now a central office administrator, the, the level of confidence that I have knowing that the individuals from the Livonia Police Department, whether we call them to respond to an incident or we contact them to get some guidance or direction with an incident, it, it is so reassuring to know that they are a phone call away and two minutes away from just about any of our, our buildings to get there. They, they have never let us down. Their responsiveness is incredible. Their partnership is invaluable. Um, and I can't stress that, uh, bless you, I can't stress that enough. Um, and also we have a uh, district safety committee, and this is made up of uh, people throughout the district uh, and overseen by Mr. Raymond. And we work there to review our safety procedures, our protocols, our practices, um, and uh, that's a sounding board and a group that we really work to try and be uh, as, as reflective as we can when things happen uh, as an emergency at some of the you know, other schools or other venues to see what we can learn from those and implement into our procedures, um, but then also be proactive um, and make sure that our staff uh, are well trained. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce Again, our administrator for public safety, Mr. John Raymond. Mr. Raymond retired from the Bowling Police Department after 25 years. Uh, he's been with the district now about six years. Uh, his, his proud parent of an LPS graduate, certainly has a vested interest in our schools and in our community. Uh, while he worked with the Bowling Police Department, he served as a, a patrol officer. Uh, he also was a mentor to younger officers. He's been a detective. He's been a patrol sergeant, uh, and at the time of his retirement, uh, was the sergeant in charge of the Special Victims Unit. Um, we are extremely lucky in the district uh, to have a person of his background and experience available to us and on staff uh, in leading us in these uh, efforts. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Raymond. Thank you, Mr. I really, really sincerely want to thank you for coming out tonight and expressing interest in our safety program for the schools. Um, when I get up here talking, I want to talk a lot about how we respond to what our plan is to respond to an active shooter. Our safety plan for the schools is multi-hazard, multi covers a lot of different situations. What, most, what people have been most interested in the last couple of weeks since Florida is, what do you the one public schools do to protect my child if something like this happens? I want to lay out uh, kind of a thumbnail sketch of what our program is and then kind of run you through what we teach during the drill. I think it's important that you know those details. Um, most importantly, I'd like to start with prevention. The easiest thing to handle this is if we can set something up to prevent it. Then we move out of training. It's very important that we train our staff and our students how to respond when something does happen. And then we want to give them the communication piece. Because if something terrible happens, it's incredibly important for us to get that information to you as quickly as we can. Prevention, the best thing we can do to, is prevent it. That's the easiest thing we can do. The way we do that is, is have people report. Now, people have a really hard time reporting. Should I call 911? Who should I call? Who do I report it to? I'm not sure if I have enough information. I'm really taking a guess at this. We try to put mechanisms in place so it's really simple to call. Um, you've heard the saying, see something, say something. We're just trying to reinforce it. Even if you have that little shred of doubt, should I, should I call or not? Please call. Give that information to somebody so we can follow up on it. You can hear Chief Kate talk later about what the Livonia Police Department does when they get that information, no matter how, how slight or small that information is. And something else that uh, we utilize, one of the tools that uh, we like to use, and I'll tell you why it's put in place, is the OK to Say tip line. This is set up by the uh, State of Michigan Attorney General's Office. Back in the 1990s, they, uh, Secret Service put together a program and said, okay, let's use their threat assessment skills that we use to protect people and see if we can use those to figure out how we identify a school shooter. So they do this study and they decide, you know, there's no really good profile for a school shooter. They come in all same shapes and sizes. But the one most important thing that they did identify is that in 8% of these situations, somebody besides the shooter knew that this was going to happen or, or had information that could have prevented it. Well, what happened was people didn't know who to deliver the information to and where to get it to. So their instruction was, 
why we set up the appliance to make it easier for people to call. The way that our program set up in the state of Michigan is they make it as easy as possible for anybody to call. You can telephone, you can send them a text, you can send an email, you can use their app. Why do they do it in so many different ways? Well, I don't think my kid knows that their phone has a voice feature on it. They can text them, okay? So they send this information out. They want that information any way they can get it. The nice part about this too is it operates 24 7. It's staffed all night, all weekend. Somebody's there to receive that tip and make sure it goes out to the proper agency to follow up on it. Be it the police department, community mental health, child protective service, the schools. Somebody's going to get that information that's going to get followed up on it. The other part, the information they're looking for is what they call what the Secret Service identifies as information leads. When they were searching for information on a profile for schools, I'm sorry, when they were searching for information to develop a profile of school shooters, they decided they determined that there was information that was leaking. Like I said, at least one other person knew. So these people may not necessarily say, hey, this is my plan, I'm going to go to school and shoot up the school tomorrow. But they want to brag about their capabilities. They want to show you the guns that they have. They want to post them on the internet. They want to show their friends. They want to show how they can make bombs. They're posting how they make bombs and what the effectiveness of the bombs are. They need people to see that to report to other people. It's, I don't like to sit around watching people all day looking to see who's making really big bombs. But they're, you know, if my friend's doing it, I might be looking to see what's going on. Hopefully this person will report it to the easiest mechanism they have. The other point of prevention we have is the school security personnel that we hire and utilize it. We uh, contract with a company called Blue Line to provide security in our secondary buildings. As Mr. Archibald was explaining, all of our blue, most of our Blue Line guys are either, well, all of the Blue Line guys are either retired police officers, off duty police officers, retired paramedics, and paramedics. The reason we like using these guys is the level of training they had received when they were police officers. They've been trained in the active shooter protocol. They've got an extensive amount of training that they bring with them, life experience as well. They work very closely with the administration and school resource officers day in and day out in the operations of school. The thing I really appreciate about them is they're really good at building rapport with students. They're communicating with students, they're approachable with students, and they're developing that information. It's another way to get that information that we need to prevent these sort of things. A little hasty flip on the slide. Speaking of other personnel, uh, we also work with school resource officers. The Livonia Police assigns a police officer who specializes as a school resource officer to each of our high schools. They work in that high school. They're there all day, every day. They also service the other schools in that triad. Chief Gates is going to tell you a little bit more about how that works as well, so I don't want to get too far into it. Now, we get into uh, facility enhancements, the things that we do. The things that we do. Probably the biggest change we've seen when we read our buildings or renovate our buildings is a secure vestibule. We don't have an open door to the public anymore. Okay? You need to come up and identify yourself as secretary and have her recognize you and bring you into the building. You just can't walk into the building anymore. It gives them the opportunity to assess your intent and what your reason is for being there. And it's also not all about the active shooter. We're not locking up the guys walking out the front door with a gun slung over the shoulder. There's a lot of other reasons, and a lot of other people we just don't want to walk into the student section of the building. We need you to come in, to recognize that there's a chance to assess why you're there, and then go inside. Once you get let in the office, there's a second step that they utilize. You need to check in, have a short conversation with them, explain your business. If you're there, if there's something they can handle in the office, they'll take care of in the office, they'll, they'll let you go back out the front door. If you have a business, if you have an appointment down the hallway, if you're going in that student section, they're going to ask you to sign in and put a sticker on it, identify the yes. I have received authorization from the principal to get in this part of the building, back to the students, back to the children. It's also a decision point for secretaries. If you get a person that comes in and does not want to cooperate with you, does not want to take that simple and easy step of, hey, I'm signing in, I'm telling you what my business, which, what my business is, and putting that sticker on and getting the authority to go in, they break a small rule. Well, the reason to break a small rule is probably not the way to break a really big rule. We don't want that to happen. They walk past, they don't get that authority. This is a decision point for secretaries. We want to reinforce for them to make it really easy to say, skip that step. What's going on? You think I should call the police? No, we instruct them. If they walk past you and they don't sign in there, 
following your procedures. They're now on intruder at the student section. We need to dial 911. That is an emergency for us. The PA system. We've enhanced the capability of the PA system. Our old system, you had to call down the office, they had one great big microphone in the office, and that's where they made all their announcements from. The biggest enhancement we did for a PA system is you can pick up any phone in the building, dial into the PA system, and make an announcement from any, any phone in that building. You can access it anywhere. So you're not having to call the office, add another step, and ask them to get on the big microphone. Anybody can access that with the code and make whatever announcement they need to make. That's going to be very important when you make an emergency announcement about active violence in the building. Classroom door locks. Bottom line is, we made it very easy to be able to lock that classroom door from inside the classroom. We changed our hardware. We made it easy. And egress windows. If a classroom has a new, new window installed in it, it's got to have an egress access point. So we need an egress door. The fire code says you've got to have two points of exit for every room. If you have a single door, you have to be able to get out of the window. They make it very easy for us. This is going to be very important when we talk about escaping from that room and for other reasons later on in the presentation. Let's talk about a drills, procedures, and protocols. For me, this is the most important part of any response plan. You can buy all the equipment in the world, but the most important part is how you train the people to utilize that equipment. Okay? This is our chance to teach and practice response in case we can't prevent things. As a parent, and when we set this program up, we consider all the staff in the building to be immediate responders. We're very fortunate to live in a, in a community. When I dial 911, the police and fire department is going to be here in a couple minutes. But when I drop my child off at school in the morning, I expect where I'm working there to be able to take care of that emergency in the first couple of minutes until the police and fire get there. So we consider them and try and reinforce it. You are the immediate responders for whatever happens, whatever emergency we have. We try to give them the tools and training to manage that situation until the police and fire get there. We do multiple drills each year. We do fire drills, we do severe weather drills, tornado drills, and we do lockdown drills. You can hear me use the words active violence and I'm referring to lockdown drills. We get caught up in what, what's our trigger word for this response. And another reason we use the word active violence, and I'm going to explain how your brain works in a few minutes, is we give you an active shooter drill, but what happens if it's now an active stabbing? Well, you gave me an active drill, you know, your brain's going to shrink, and you're going to think, well, I got an active shooter drill, but I don't have an active stabbing drill. What should I do? If it's active violence, this is your response plan. We do traditional drills, and this is, we've been doing these for years, and it's always started off in the classroom. That's traditional. What are we going to do when something like that happens? We're sitting at our desk. With us, we're at a good portion of time. But we need to consider that a lot of these incidents happen when you're at lunch, during passing time, when you're not in the classroom. We want to teach our staff and students what they should do when something happens when they're not in the classroom or in a non traditional setting. So we're required to do those kind of drills throughout the year as well. Why we drill? Because it's the most important part for us is when you're faced with a life-threatening situation, your brain is very primitive and very fast. You go back to flight, fight, flight, or freeze if somebody hasn't given you a plan. That's all your brain does. It goes back to your instinctual response. You lose your cognitive ability. You can't think of a plan. As an example, the one I like to use is, what do you do when your clothes catch fire? They stop, I'm sorry? Yep. And the reason you know that is because somebody at some point in your life, probably a really friendly fireman in about first or second, third grade, came to your school and said, hey, if your clothes catch fire, you stop, drop, and roll. They built a roadmap in your brain. They gave you a plan. They told you what to do if you faced that life threatening situation. Because if a nice fireman would come to the building or come to your class and teach you to stop, drop, and roll, what's your response going to be? You're going to fight. I got to my fire. I got to put myself up. Way of the flames. Flight. I'm on fire, I'm on fire, I'm on fire. You can run all over. It doesn't do any good. You fan the flames. Freeze. I'm on fire. I don't have a plan. I don't know what to do. I'm still on fire. I don't have a plan. I don't know what to do. Then you go back to that primitive part of your brain. Other people that did a really good job of building the road back after your brain, but when you're faced with an electronic emergency, flight attendants. You get on a plane, and they point to all the exits. Because you're, you know, if that cabin fills up with smoke and you feel your life is threatened, 
you're going to want to go out that front door to the left if that's how you got on. That's how you break them in if you got them in and out of that plane. But they point out, the exit's there, the exit's there, and why do you need to have these? They're building a map for you. They're telling you, look at the lighted floor. That'll help you get to the door. If we have a sudden heat compression, this is how the mask works, because you're not going to be able to think of how to put it on if we have a sudden heat compression. They built that roadmap. They built that idea of what to do in emergency on that airplane. Something else to keep in mind, you're going to lose your fine motor skills. The fire department's really good about accommodating this as well. Next time you walk by a fire exit, the one with the great big red sign on, look at it. It doesn't have a doorknob on it. Take your fingers and work the doorknob. I've been working the doorknobs for 50 years. I'm pretty good at it. But if you put me in a hot, smoky room and I'm scared, my hand's not going to work. The fire department has a really nice handle on there that I don't need one action to open it with. I hit it with anything. My hips, my, my hands, whatever. If that part's going to work, I'm going to hit it with that run. But they, they figured out that the brain's not going to work. I can't figure out if you can turn that handle, take a step back, and walk out. They figured out that you're just not going to be thinking. You're going to be running and not be able to grab that. So that's how your brain works when faced with a white girl white situation. That's why we do these girls. We do three lockdown girls a year.
we think of four or five that door if we beat our state, the next step is what can I do next to keep myself and my students safe? We keep working on that. We don't give you permission to just give up, to stop. That's not the end of a drill either. Okay? We you've heard the heard, heard me use the words run hide fight at the door call. I struggle with the word hide. Okay? That's a passive act. And remember how your brain is structured when somebody taught you something? So I walked off third grade with a really nice car that came in and gave that lesson to stop, drop, and roll. We all went out to recess and played hide and seek the recess. And what do we do when we got found? It was game over. So now we're telling people, well, we're just going to hide if we're faced with active violence. But what happens if you get found when you're hiding during active violence? It's game over. You've got to have a plan. You can't just end with hide. What do we do to, to avoid that? We coach our students to escape. We coach our students to enhance their escape. Whatever they need to do to run out of that room and enhance that by distracting the person who's trying to hurt them. One of the first things we do is everybody's up and ready to run. We, we, don't, we don't sleep anymore. In the schools, everybody likes to sleep crisscross the applesauce. And, you know, we're going to wait out our drill here because we're hiding really good, hard really quiet. We don't do that anymore. It takes a really long time. You've got to get up and start that when you feel like okay? We teach them. Stand and be ready. We coach those students. We tell them two things. Stand and be ready to run. Go in any kind of different direction. If you want to be small, be low, kneel down. Okay, but we're not hiding at that point. The teachers give an instruction. If I yell run, if that door fails, go out of this room any way we can. These are our exits. We can get out here, we can get out the window. If we're gonna run out of this room, they're not telling you this part, but they're saying, put something in your hands to throw. We're not even giving instructions where to throw it. But the point being is, if I'm there to hurt you, and I've got a lot of chaos and confusion, and I'm just flying through the air, and a bunch of kids running in different directions to get out of that room, it's confusing for me as a bad guy. If it happens to be a geometry book that bounces off my forehead, it's really confusing and distracting. It means a couple more people are gonna get out safely. So that's why we do our drills that way. Okay? We end up working with you next. We're ready to run. We tell them you're ready to run. You want to plant that, that plan, that roadmap in the brain. Hey, if my teacher yells run, I've got to get out of the room any way I can. If I'm running out, I'm going to join something. I'm creating chaos and getting out. That's part of our drill. The bottom line is we don't wait for further instructions. We need to be proactive and dynamic and think about what we can do next. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about terminology too, okay? Part of our communication is we want to make sure we're all speaking the same language. You watch the news and you'll hear, you know, well, they did a code right in this building, and, you know, they did a lockdown, they did a soft lockdown. Because a parent, if you see lockdown and any kind of communication, that's hard stop. okay? We try to avoid that word for a number of reasons. That word's only going to be used if we're conditioned to use it, if we're faced with active violence. If I start yelling lockdown, that's what's stuck in my brain. It's because somebody's heard it, students, staff, teachers, kids, in front of me, and I want to sound that alarm. I'm not going to fall back on that. I'm going to start yelling lockdown. But well, we'll start off with shelter in place. You might hear that terminology used quite a bit. That's uh, mostly environmental. We have a couple of expressways running through our city. We have some train tracks running through our city. There's a lot of hazardous material flows through our city. If the fire department shows up, sees a tank flipped over and his baby leaking out and it's blowing down there and they know there's a couple schools down there, they're going to figure out what it is, how far it's going to blow and what kind of hazard it represents. And they might call us and say, you guys better shelter in place. All it means is we're coming inside, we're canceling out the recess, we're not going outside, we're shutting off our air handling systems. We just don't want to be out there with bad things are blowing through the air. You're going to hear enhanced security procedures. There have been days, and the police department's pretty good about communicating, communicating this to us, where they're out chasing bad guys from the neighborhoods, and they're headed towards the school. It's probably, you know, they're using canines, and they're chasing bad people. It's probably a really bad time to have outdoor recess. They call us up, we bring the kids inside, and we enhance our security procedures. We're not being outside, we're coming inside. If we've got to make some movement between buildings, we're going to have extra staff outside. You know, when I talk about movement between buildings, Kids walk from Churchill to Career Center, that sort of thing. And we're doing transportation. We want to make sure it's safe before we stop the bus 
drop kids off, that sort of thing. And we're basically bringing people inside, we're double checking things coming in the building, and we're just extra aware that yeah, the cops are in the area and they're looking for somebody, and probably that somebody didn't do anything that we want to be involved in. We don't want them in our building. You'll hear the words hold in place, close the line, and pass the doors. This is a tool for the principals to just be able to say, okay, everybody stop where you're at. You need to do something precautionary. You want to stay in your classroom, no passing time, no going to lunch right now. You close the line of classroom doors, but keep teaching, okay? It's a precautionary thing. It's like when I put a seatbelt on when I'm driving in the rain. I don't plan on crashing, but it's nice to have that extra little security with me. If I close the, close the line of classroom doors, so that's a little bit of security. Wherever you use this, I'm thinking primarily in a medical situation. If I have a catastrophic medical event and it's passing time, it's hard for the fire department to get all that medical equipment into me. They have a hard time finding me because the halls are full of kids. And me as a patient, I really don't want to be put in a gurney, treat them by the fire department, and they're rolled out past all my students. So I want a little dignity, I want a little privacy. If we hold in place, keep everybody in, the hallway's clear, they can find me. I'm not facing a bunch of students, and I get a real easy quick ride out of the ambulance. They're not trying to throw it through a bunch of kids. And then we talked about lockdown, active violence. We talked about that, we said that for a very specific incident. If somebody's actively being hurt, that's when we use that word. Our communications. Where we have it set up is the first priority for the principals, the staff, the teachers, is to manage that emergency. We don't want them distracted, distracted with, man, I, I'm trying to figure this out, but I've really got to put something out to the parents, you know. We know that's a priority. We think, we feel that the first priority is they need to deal with the situation without distraction. All they got to do is make one phone call to the board office. It triggers a lot of the protocols that we put in place, and we take a look, well, we help with communication. And we start making phone calls within the district. We need to not notify operations, Start handling things, operations being building, handle facilities, transportation. We want to stop the buses there, but we got to divert buses away from that area. These are the kind of phone calls we got to make during that part of the communication process. And then we're also gathering information to get to the parents. We got to be very certain we have to know fast before we start putting information out to you. Okay? We need to confirm information. Okay? We're, we can get it from us. We can't send you rumors, we can't send you conjecture, we can't send you our best guess. You've got to be served before we put it out to you. Okay? And we work very, very hard to get that to you as fast as we possibly can. Because we know that you're getting information from your child's cell phone, you're getting a text. Hey, something bad is happening in my school, they just need the lockdown order or holding in place. That makes your heart stop as a parent. But we recognize that the most important part, or one of the big, the very big piece of our communication process, is your child's cell phone. As a parent, I know as long as I get tests my child, they're okay. They're not hurt. Okay? We accept that. We re as a district, we realize that. But we also realize our responsibility when we start giving you official information that's got to be good information. And we might start telling you, your children what to start texting you. Okay? We might start telling you that hey, the situation's been handled. Mom and dad are going to move us to a different building. This is where we're going to do your reunification point. We'll start getting tests like that from your child. So we recognize that and we want to utilize that tool as best we can. When we start putting information out, we're not going to change systems, we're not going to use different tools, we're not going to tell you to look in places that you're not used to seeing. We use the tools that we're familiar with. Okay? We use the e-blast system, we might put out voice calls to you, we might put out text messages. We're going to use a system that we use put out snow alerts or snow day notifications or strength of danger notifications. When you get that text and you get that email, that's the same system that do it. We want you to know to look at, hey, I might have to look at my phone for a text. I might have to check my email. I might have to go to the LPS website. We're going to work very hard to get information out via those meetings that you need to see. And we're going to do it as fast as we possibly can. Speaking of communication, one of the things that we use to communicate our protocols or our plans this parent emergency guide, we have it in bag with you. We put this together, we kind of boiled down our emergency plan, many, many different facets of it. We put it on one sheet. We try to make it easy for you to find, read, and just kind of give you the reader's guide to the version of what, what we do.
I want to talk about reunification. We want to get your child back to you as quickly as possible. Okay? We want to get the information of what's going on and where to go get them at. Okay? You got to keep in mind that something bad happens in your child's school. We may have to leave that school. We may have to evacuate and go to a whole different location. We got to let the police and fire department, emergency services, do what they need to do within that building. We want to take the kids out of the situation, put them someplace safe, and get them back to you. We have a process for that. First thing we need to realize is we may not be at your child's school. We're going to go to find you where to go. When you get there, we're going to ask you to fill out a parent reunification card. Okay? You need your child's name, you need your child's teacher. Because the teachers, part of their protocol is they keep the kids together the best they can. And they're going to help us identify who that child is. We need to have you give us a starting point. As, we, as the district works down through this, the next most important point we're going to have here is who picks up the child. Okay? It sounds really simple, it'd be really fun and quick if we could just say, okay, go with my dad, go with my dad, go, go with somebody. Um, your neighbor's going to pick up, um, yeah, okay, just go home with you. you can't do that. Here's the scenario that I'm worried about that we need to work around. There's going to be a place where you sign off that you pick up the child or who we identify as picking up the child. So if my ex-wife, who doesn't like me very much, shows up and picks up my child I'm very concerned about 20 minutes before I get there, and she does not tell me, and I don't get that communication, and I show up 20 minutes after my, my child is gone, it's unacceptable for, unacceptable for us as a district to come back and say, well, Mr. Raymond, we have no idea where your child's at. We're looking for her, we just can't find her. We can't give you that answer, okay? Now, if I have this filled out, I can go pull this information and figure out, oh, Mr. Raymond, Mrs. Raymond picked your child up 20 minutes ago, okay? That's how we track that information. A few other points too, and I know I'm asking a lot of you to run uphill here, but please don't jump in your car and race up in the building. It's going to really confuse the situation. Okay? A couple things going on here. Please give the fire department the police department time to do what they need to do. I get it's your first instinct to want to run up there and help your child. The other problem we have is we get a couple hundred cars, thousands of cars racing up to school, we block ambulances in. Our department knows injured people on ambulance and they're blocking by a bunch of cars. They're not going to get the help they need as fast as they can. So please, don't race up to school. When you do go to the reunification place, point. Bring your identification with you. Chances are it's not going to be a staff member that's familiar with you. We're going to need to identify you. We're going to have to look at your child's emergency care and make sure that the person that's there to pick them up is authorized to pick them up. With that said, Please add extra people to your child's emergency card. If something terrible does happen, and your child's primary leader shows up and says, hey, I want to pick up my troop. As, as long as they're on the card, we'll send them home with her. So if she wants to take 12 kids home with her, as long as she's got 12 kids' cards, we can do that. But think about alternatives for you as a parent. If I can't get there, lights be fast. Who else can I trust to pick up my child? Is it a neighbor? Is it your your child's classroom. Think about adding them to your emergency card. With that, that is pretty much in a nutshell <coughs> what our emergency protocol is when you go with active violence and get your child back to you and communicate that information to you. So again, I really, really appreciate you coming out to give this information. Thank you. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Um, before I get started, uh, I wanted just a, a couple quick comments. I want to thank the superintendent and her staff uh, and the board for putting this together tonight. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to come together as a community and discuss this very, very important event. Uh, and I want to also introduce the folks that are up here on the stage from both the Morning Police Department and West County Police Department because I think it's important for you to know who these folks are and what their responsibilities are. Uh, and put a, you have a face behind the name. And starting at the back is Sergeant Ron Moore. Sergeant Moore has been with the police department for 20 something years, and I struggle with that at times. Um, and, and Sergeant Moore is in charge of, amongst other things, the school resource officer program. So all of our school resource officers report to him amongst some other detectives as well. Uh, but he is the boss of the SRO program. He coordinates a lot of the activities that we have 
uh, as a police agency with LPS, with the school system, and Clarence Will and other, other institutions as well. And next to him is Captain Danny Kewen. Captain Kewen, in our police department, we're broken down into three divisions, if you will, a uniform division, investigative division, and administrative. Uh, Captain Kewen is the commanding officer of the uniform division. So anyone that wears a uniform, with the exception of me, uh, <laughs> he is their boss. Uh, so he is a division commander with the, with the Lamoni Police Department. And we have Officer Reardon from Westland Police Department. He's a school resource police. They stand there, do it. You're handsome. Uh, he's, he's a school resource officer uh, in the Westland, uh, city of Westland, but Lavonia Public School System uh, uh, does encroach or go, go beyond the, the border of Troy Road, which is our southern border, into Westland. He is responsible for, for the, the schools in the Westland, the city of Westland, the LPS schools in Westland. And then Officer Max Christie, uh, for those of you that are, are Stevenson folks, he is your guy. He is the SRO. Nice smile. Uh, he is the SRO. I like to have a little bit of fun. Uh, SRO for Stevenson High School. And Max has been with our agency for a number of years. He's a great, uh, a great officer for a number of years, let alone a school resource officer. He was at Churchill before being assigned here, has a, a depth of experience in dealing with the kids, and he had, is, is a great resource. Thanks, Max. And Captain Ron Tag, Captain Tag is uh, uh, in charge of our investigative section. So all the detectives, all the, all the groups that are, assigned, that are assigned to do investigations, plain post things, outside of undercover investigations and things of that nature, fall under Captain Tag, and he is also our PIO, our Public Information Officer. And we have Sergeant Higgison that's in the group that we'll be speaking in a little bit, so Sergeant Higgison, through the chain of command, or paramilitary organization, report to Captain Tag. Captain Tag, it's worth noting as well, is the commanding officer of the Western Wayne Special Operations Team. And basically, that's a SWAT team. Uh, we are, Livonia is a member, and actually we're, we're the anchor of the Western Wayne Special Operations Team, and that encompasses Western Wayne County. And uh, what that means essentially is that if there's an incident that requires the, the activation of those special resources, he is going to be in charge of it and oversee all, all of that. In addition to that, he has a level of expertise that is second to none when it comes to training uh, law enforcement specifically uh, with active shooter and tactical operations from a law enforcement perspective. He's been, he's endorsed his team really to teach this throughout the state of Michigan by MMRMA, Michigan Municipal, Municipal Risk Management Association, and quite frankly, uh, and some of you may have even attended some of the seminars, there's no one better, and there's no group better than, than Captain Tag and his staff. So thank you. So I'm going to uh, spend a couple minutes uh, discussing our response to uh, you know, threats and should something really bad happen, what you can expect from the Livonia Police Department. Um, with that, as I mentioned, you know, when I first took the stage, uh, you, know, you know, recently we, there's certainly been some terrible things that have happened in our country. Um, whether it's the Park of Florida shooting and there's other, other incidents that occur uh, of violence, uh, even sometimes without, without weapons. And as a law enforcement uh, institution here, that is something in, in, in a broader context that is uh, something that we really struggle with. And when I, when I say that, it's, it's national security concerns. What are the motivations of certain people and certain groups? All of these things are, are constantly at the forefront of, of, for us, in any event that we have in the city or school, because I mean, where there's a density of population, and you think about spree. How many people are at spree, especially on fireworks night, especially on Saturday, Friday, the big nights? How do we, the Boney Police Department, prepare for that? And when you think of all the things that happen, that we see that, that happen really across the world, whether it's somebody with a, with a vehicle driving into a crowd, whether it's IEDs, whether it's active shooter, sharp edge weapons, all of these things, how do you prepare? In our society, the United States of America, how do we, we're a free country, 
How does a, does a government agency, a law enforcement agency, prepare and respect all of that and, and deal with it when it comes up? It's very, very, very complicated. And as, as a result of that, I mean, there's, there's restrictions that get put in place that we try to control so that we can help keep everybody safe so they can enjoy, uh, whether it's the spree or coming to school or going to shopping or shopping at a mall. Uh, but all of this, the core to it, is cooperation with the different groups or the owners of the property, whatever it may be if it's on private property. But specific, specifically to the Lombardi Public School System, we are very, very fortunate that there's a great crew uh, of administrators in all of the schools, the staff, but the leadership with LPS and the board coordinating with the city response is second to none. I have the cell phone of, of the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, they have mine. They need something, I'm a phone call away. If I need something, they're a phone call away. It's just that simple. And, and that's how we do our business. We work together, we meet together, we talk, we talk about contingencies, what if scenarios, and we plan for those. As terrible as they are to have to discuss, we do. And we try to be prepared for those god-awful events. Again, praying that they never occur. But it's very important for us to make sure that we have that relationship and we do. And I want to thank you for, for that, for the board and for the administration. Um, our training and preparedness for school emergencies, but this is even in a more broad term. And I touched on, on the spree, but any place that we have uh, a density of population, any kind of a work group, any kind of a factory, we have four transmission. Uh, we have a number of large facilities in the city. And as, as mentioned by, by John Raymond, we also have a number of facilities that potentially are targets because of the type of hazardous material that they have on staff there, or right, on site there, and how, again, whether police and fire, how we respond to those things. So we train, uh, I, we are very, very aggressive, Lavonia Police Department, in our training. Uh, in so many different ways. There's no other police department that I'm aware of in the state that trains as, as aggressively and we, as we do in so many different ways. Not the Michigan State Police, not any other police agency that I'm aware of. Where we, we, we do realistic hands-on training so that our folks are prepared, as prepared as they can be, to deal with, with a variety of different events. And that's, that's challenging as well. I mean, police officers are no different than anyone here. They're human beings, and we, we prepare them for the things that they may see in an active shooter situation. And for instance, in a school, if we have an active shooter in school and we have children that are injured, children that are dead, and we expect them to walk right by them and try to locate the threat, children that are crying, looking for all of us as parents, when you need help, who do you look for? But the police officer is going to walk right by him. And that's where you train them. And it's a terrible thing. I mean, all of us, certainly as parents, what do you want to do when you hit when there's a child that's crying, a child is hurt? You want to comfort them, you want to make you want to make their world right again, right now, right now. And we can't do it. If we have an active shooter situation, we have to go to the threat. As soon as we get there, we're born for the threat. Point, but we're going to do everything we can to eliminate it. And that means we're going to walk by people that need us. That's a very difficult thing to accept. As a human being, as a police officer, as a firefighter, it doesn't matter. That's what we're going to end up doing. And it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. And again, going to our staff, preparing them for that, putting them in, in real life situations that if you're called upon, this is what you're going to do. This is what you have to do. How do you turn off that emotion? So on, on my end, from, from the police chief, I'm trying to make, uh, prepare our people for these things and equip them and train them, invest in them so that they are prepared to do what they have to do. And, uh, and it, is, it is challenging. But we are we're engaged, we're completely engaged, again, with the, the school system. They know our protocols, they know what to expect from us, and we know what to expect from them. It is truly a partnership all the way around. And with the common thread is, of course, the security and safety of the students and the staff as we move forward. Our school, our lines of communication, I think that kind of speaks for itself as far as uh, uh, what I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're, we're, we have so many different resources to communicate.
communicate, but again, for, from our level, that's all of us on a phone call away. Our school resource officers, each of our high schools in, in the Livonia Public School System, we have two school, school districts in the, in the city of Livonia. One is Clarenceville, of course, the largest is Livonia Public Schools. And for the Livonia Public School System, we have a school resource officer in each one of our high schools. They also spread out some of their time to some of the middle schools when they're needed, and they do other assignments as well. Each of our school resource officers are specifically trained. You just don't pick a, a, a guy or gal out of, the, out of the, the police officer flock and say, hey, you're an SRO today, and off you go. Uh, they, they, ask, they indicate they're interested in it. They have to apply, basically, to my office. We review that and make a determination, and then we invest in training to help prepare them to serve the school system in each of the schools uh, as police officers. They're not, they're not teachers. They're not school administrators, and, and we've seen some incidents where some schools you know, throughout the country expect the police officers to enforce school rules, and that's not what we do. We're, we ask that. We're an asset to the school system or to the, to the school administrator, but we are there to be law enforcement officers, and that's what we expect of our SROs when they're, they're assigned to each one of these schools. Prevention response, again, coming back to the, the common theme, is training and working with the school district and, and working out different scenarios, mainly with the staff, but also with the students on these different what-up scenarios. And not only with that, but, but hardening up the target. What can we do in this building? If, if, if Officer Christie, as he's here, and he notices that, hey, you know, we, have, we have a security issue, this potential breach here, something that was overlooked, bring it to the attention of the, the, the administrator of the school so that they can look into it, they can make a determination of, of making a, correcting the situation. But we're always looking for, for areas of weakness and, and trying to be very proactive in, in that arena. Responding and investigating school threats. Um, this, this, this topic uh, is, is you know, when we look at Parkland and we look at a, a, a lot of uh, the other school shootings and even beyond that that, occur, that have occurred, sometimes there are uh, threats that, you, we, that may have been received prior to the incident that may be ignored or not taken seriously. That is not our policy. We receive a threat, no matter how slight it is, whether it's something posted on social media, something scrawled on a wall. I don't care what the source is, we are all over it that day, that moment. We don't wait. We're not going to wait till Monday morning at 9 a.m. and start looking at it. And the superintendent knows it, call her in the middle of the night, hey, we've got some information, and, and we're going after it. And we're going to take it to, to the nth degree to find out who's behind it and the credibility. Fortunately, the threats that we've investigated so far I think where we at about 40 or so, and, uh, and it's a lot of resources. We are knocking on people's doors right away to try to determine the source of it, again, the credibility, so that we can do what we can to make sure that the school, or whatever is named in that, is, is safe and secure going forward. So it's, it's, it's not a time, it's not a time element, it is an immediate response to the threat and then we make our determination as quickly as possible. So all of this, you know, from, the, from the police law enforcement perspective, uh, is you know, very important for us and in our community as a whole. We take our responsibility, all of our officers do very, very seriously in, in our approach uh, consistently, not, not just in this specific area, but our service to the community is, is we strive for excellence across the board. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're very, very committed in preparing our staff and giving the best service that we can, law enforcement service, to this community as a whole, no matter what it may be. And we've got a great, great team of folks that are, that are certainly committed to that. And I'm very proud of all of them. We had a memorial ceremony yesterday over at Hazel Park at Five in Farmington, and uh, just a great, great group of folks overall. Um, just a, a final comment, I'm going to turn this over to Officer Rear to, to speak uh, more of the Westland. But I want to thank you all for being here. I mean, this is, is there a more important topic, you know, today than what there is, than, than this? 
And, uh, and it's awesome that you took the time, especially on this nice evening, to be here. But you know what's sad? All of these open seats. All of these open seats on such an important topic, this place should be packed, standing room only. Because all these invitations, as I understand, what went out to every every family in the Livonia Public School System, which is what's that number? Andrea? Fourteen, 14 over fourteen thousand. So I commend you, all of you, for taking the time. <laughs> this is your school district. This is your city, and you need to be engaged. So once again, thank you all for being here. And with that, Officer Rear, the stage is yours. You don't have a, you have a dark screen, so if you needed that, you're in big trouble. Thank you, Chief. Um, I'm gonna keep it short and sweet. There's, uh, I think that most topics have been covered. Um, however, I just wanna let you know that uh, I am a school resource officer of the uh, Wayne West Elementary School, Dis school District. Uh, half my salary is paid for by the Wayne Westland Community School District. That doesn't mean that I stop at Wayne Westland. Um, there's three schools, uh, Hayes Elementary, Cooper Elementary, and uh, Johnson Hall Elementary that fall within the city parameters in, in Westland. All just south of Joy Road and uh, it is part of the Bullion Public Schools. Uh, when they need a response or if something happens at their school, nine times out of ten they're calling Livonia's or John Raymond and he's informed them, well, you got to call West End. Uh, so then they give, give me a call and I respond at that point. Um, crimes occur within their schools, um, around their schools, and that's something that I deal with. Uh, if there's uh, an active shooter type threat that happens within their schools, West End's going to take primary control of that, uh, and then we're going to be assisted by Livonia PD. Um, and then they go vice versa too. If Livonia has an active shooter type of threat or a violent situation at one of their schools, and they need our response, uh, and they need our help, we'll be happy to assist them as well. Um, well, with, with that, I mean, other than that, the, the only other real big topic I wanted to cover was, um, and it, it was said a little bit, uh, Mr. Raymond said it in, in his, but it's something that we've been seeing quite a bit within our district is uh, social media and the issues that are coming from social media. Um, we're encouraging all the parents within our district to really stay on top of their kids and their social media accounts, uh, looking through them on, on, a, on an active basis, on a periodic basis, making sure that uh, nothing's being shared, nothing's being said that shouldn't be said. Um, a lot of the threats that we've been getting has been social media that's been shared and shared and shared, and it's been really, really clogging up our investigations and trying to get back to the source of who maybe uh, gave this threat initially. And the scary thing is, is that these kids are sharing it to everybody, but nobody's sharing it with the police. So we're depending on the parents to really get involved uh, with their kids and check out on their social media. And um, if you see something, um, please give us a call, report it to us, let us do our job, and uh, investigate it thoroughly at that point. So that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you, Officer Reardon. Thank you, Chief Kate, officers. You may uh, exit the stage if you wish. Uh, that was an excellent segue. Um, I would like to bring to the stage teacher, Mr. Mitchell, and principal, Mr. Stromberg, who, again, Officer Reardon's segue was perfect talking about social media, so I will turn it over to them. Yes, it was an absolutely perfect segue, I think, to um, go ahead and talk about the social media. We're gonna be, we're gonna hit on it a little quickly here. We're here to talk very quickly about we are aware and, and what's happening in our schools and what we see in the schools and why we're here. First of all, I'm a computer tech teacher. My name is David Mitchell. I teach computer tech. I've taught it since 2000. I've had a front row seat to the evolution that is the internet and social media and being at homes all these years, I've seen what kids have done and what they're doing. And then moving over to my partner here, 
and uh, starting my 30th year in education, and I have three older kids, and now I have an eighth grader. Boy, have times changed. So I have that whole perspective of just seeing what it was like being a principal 15 years ago and what it's like now in this role that social media is having on our job. So again, we could be up here for hours talking about this because we love this topic and we know it means a lot to the kids. So we'll just kind of hit some main points for you. And, and that's a thing to mention too. I also have a seventh and eighth grader, so I'm going through it as a parent looking to people like him. And then I also coach a hockey team. I coach the students in hockey team here which social media to them is absolutely everything, of course. So just going quick here, the one thing we know for certain, first of all, we're not experts up here because to say we're experts, the first time that we say we're an expert, it will change. So the only thing we know is that social media has increased like crazy, up to over 80%. You know, we joked earlier, I joked with Mr. Stromberg that he was at the bottom there in the 24%, and he's even now joined the 81 or so percent and come to that world. So, and I would say in the middle school and the teen world, it's it's over 90 to 95%. It, it's been fascinating to watch how many seventh and eighth graders have come in now with the device when five, 10 years ago, it was a few eighth graders here, some seventh graders here, and now it seems like they're all connected for a lot of very good reasons, very safe reasons, they're connected. So we know it's moving up. They're going to touch on, and I know we're going to touch on it a little bit later here. As the police officer mentioned, the social media aspect, the digital footprint. I, I cannot stress how key this is. The, the, the digital footprint, and, and we tell our students that everything that they send, they post, they click, whatever, it now leaves a digital footprint. It now, right at right, the minute they send it out, they can't get it back. And we explain to them even further when they send something, how it could be screenshotted, how people could share it. And then it's that exponential fan that one person goes to two, and two people go to four, and four go to eight, and you cannot get it back. I, I know I'm an NFL draft guy, and then the night before the draft, there was a quarterback from Wyoming, sure enough, tweets that he sent out back in high school came out the night before the draft. And this guy, these, those were four or five years ago. And they came on and they were impacting his life four or five years later. People are looking at this stuff. Colleges, I mean, no longer do you need really a resume before you go into a resume with a job. High school students even are going in and they know people, they know about you from your online profile. It, it really is an online resume. So the digital footprint, everything they do, everything they send. And, and I know that this is a big topic. So many times we're asked about what's popular, what's popular, and we've been through the gamut, and we've seen, and I always go and talk about the desk in his office. We tell our students, because he's pulled me in, I was an assistant principal for a year, I've done the tech thing for a number of years, and he pulls me into his office quite often when there's a social media issue, and we've seen so many times that lives have been changed by something they sent or posted or opened. And so parents always don't know what apps, what apps. And I'm standing here telling you, it's not as important nowadays as what apps they're using as it is how often they're using it and when they're using it. We've seen things like Ask FM, we've seen things like Kick that have kind of faded out. It really is the popular ones today are your Facebooks and your Twitter, and of course your Snapchat and Instagram. And then the one that people tend to forget about that is wildly popular is YouTube. All they do, all, we all do, I should say, keep stop saying all, watch videos over and over again and then they comment. The comments are where people are really getting themselves, kids and students are getting themselves into trouble because then they say it's not a school issue, it's not a school issue, it's not a school issue. Well, the minute it gets brought into our school and it gets brought to his attention, it becomes a school issue. So we're doing as much as we possibly can to educate our students on that these become school issues. And so we work with them and work with them and talk to them. But again, it, it, it's titled, We Are Aware. We can't do this, and I agree with the chief about the wish this room is filled because we can't do this without a collaborative effort of the families and the parents and the people that are, are with these children more often than we are. And the times, and we'll get into that briefly about what he's done 
the times that we're not with them, that they're on the phone and they're on that social media thing and, and the impacts that it's had. So it's really those, those, those standard ones. And yet it can start with a small core like this. I never underestimate what this group in here can do. And I also want, as a principal, and I share this with the rest of my colleagues, at the bottom of all of this, really is that we want kids and parents to know that we care about what they are doing out there in social media. Mr. Raymond, I can't see you out there, but it was just a few weeks ago, he called me on a, you know, of course these events happen at three o'clock on a Friday, but a student had visited a website that was concerning to us. And again, um, it's not that we have time to be looking at every website they're going to, but when they go to these sites, they are notified, they notify us, and Mr. Raymond and I are at that student's house at about 3.30 on Friday. And it's because we care about their emotional well-being. That is number one on all of those principles, and any of us that work in the schools, that is the number one factor. And that's why we want to monitor their social media for no other reason than that. Um, looking at you know, issues, boy, this is where I could spend a while, and we're just gonna keep me moving along here. Um, you know, 30 years working with teenagers, we all know that if you have a, a teenager at home, you know their number one priority is to have friends and to be liked. This social media has made it very difficult. They take a, a selfie of themselves and they put it out there for the world to see, and if they don't get 100 likes, they're taking it down. And we tell them all the time, you are not defined by this world. This isn't what defines you. So, you know, the schools are all, at every age level that's developmentally appropriate, we're working with kids to not have social media define who they are or who they're gonna become. Because it's what we often then talk about, and we always try to get our kids not to worry about what others think and not to define themselves about what others think, but social media kind of preys on that and, and puts something out there and how many likes or clicks I can get and then we talk to them about comparing. And they always, and, and we remind them, we just did today in one of our talks we had, we just, they always compare themselves up. And what don't I have? And they see something on social media and somebody says, look what I got or look where I'm going. And they always have that feeling. And so we talk about that. And he said it last, and I'll say it again. We talk about their online versus their, their real profile, who they really are on the inside versus their online. And, and, we even use the word fake and it's not real. And what, what they see online and what they see everybody because very rarely are people posting, you know, well, you know, the day didn't really go well today. So we, we talk about not, not just comparing yourselves over and over again. Empathy, one of our key words in the district. There are studies out there that talk about the amount of time that students are spending on social media actually turns off that part of the brain that deals with empathy. And we see it. We see kids say something out there that they would never go up to a person. We as adults write things that we would never go up to another adult and say. So we deal with our, our kids going, you have to remember at the end of that computer, at the end of that message, that student has a mom, has a dad, has a grandparent, has someone in there that you are talking about that level, and we role play some of that again at all these grade levels that's appropriate to make sure they don't turn off that part of their brain that we have worked so hard to try to help our kids become more empathetic. And, and I don't know if it's a hockey side of me, but I'll mention because it was a CBC story. You have one minute on hockey. Was, and I'm not going to talk hockey. But it was, it was a CBC, it. Canadian, if you Google CBC and social media and empathy, they did a study, it's fascinating, we showed our students that when they're in front of a screen, the portion of the brain that is responsible for empathy is shut off. So then we do a lesson on empathy and what it means to be put in other people's shoes. And how putting yourself in other, you can't do that when you're behind the screen. And so we really, really, really try to hit that. The other ones, real quickly, obvious the socialization, when you know there's some good and bad that when you walk in a room and all you do, and we all know that you see them, you know, if there's 30 kids and you see them all, they're all on their phones. You know, I can tell you from like he can talk about they're still not allowed in our lunch our lunch room. We still have kids talking in our lunch room. I know every team event for what I coach, every time we have a team event, a team dinner or whatever, 
I, they put down their phones. It's mandatory to put down their phones, even if they talk about their favorite colors. We've probably all seen, and we're, we're very cognizant in the educational world of knowing that those skills of being able to talk to somebody, communicate verbally, socialize, it's all, it's all right there. It's being lost a bit. So we're very well aware of that. And again, anything that can be done at, at the home as well will help us. So again, that speaks to the isolation, that speaks, speaks to online versus reality. It also goes, just brain development. What is all of this time on this, you know, these computers, on these screens, what is that doing to our brain? There's a lot of research coming out, so it's really young at this point, but it's fascinating. It is a key set of parents in here. We should be having these discussions. Uh, so again, I always try to get David, we're not talking hockey tonight. We're talking about how this is affecting the brain and what's going on. And so I have those discussions in the community. That's how we're going to grow and how we're going to become more effective with our kids. So after 16 years of being a principal, some days I feel like this. <laughs> I don't know why that still makes me laugh because there are days that I do feel that way. But obviously we've come back to just keep with our kids and think before you post. I wish we could establish what the athletic teams in the district had. Don't talk to the coach for 24 hours. We just have to ourselves pause before you send me the email. Pause before our kids send it. Easier said than done. I get it. I've had those moments too. But oh, we try to teach the kids. Don't send it. Don't post it. Just wait a little bit. And we went to DC this past weekend. Eight buses, 300 and some people. And here's some observations. I, I, I can show this first picture because first of all, we are way above 80% at this time of who's, a, who's on social media, who is a phone. I can also show because my daughter's right in the middle of that. So I always have to watch myself when I give these talks because there's my daughter. And I think we were in between and, and kids were doing a, a, a restroom stop and, and look at, that's 100% of the kids right there. And yet, I don't want people leaving thinking, oh, those of us in the schools don't see the real value of this because there's a lot of value. That picture right there, we're on the bus, and that student's solving the Twitter problem. The Twitter problem. We put cues out there, we had a thousand people following us on Twitter, the kids were doing that, and they would fill out this little puzzle. So it was a way that we were connecting with parents, parents were connecting and watching. My mom even watched it. Like, and she called me and said, I think I now have a better understanding of what you do. And she knew exactly where we went, and it was exciting, and that was nice for my mom to, to share that and to see what her granddaughter was doing on the trip. Here we were at the Vietnam Wall and the memorial, and the student was there, and he had his phone, and I knew the student pretty well. I know he's a gamer, and I go up behind him, and I'm thinking, I'm going to look over his shoulder, and I'm expecting to see he's playing the game. Instead, he's downloaded the app because he had a family member and he wanted to see where that family member was on the wall. And it's a reminder to me to say, I need to pause. And I need to say, hey, that's what technology and that whole media is life-changing. Dr. King, you know, if you haven't been to Washington, you, know, you gotta get to DC. Uh, and our guide at that point gave the kids 10 minutes. Go look at all the quotes of Dr. King. Be back right here in this spot with your favorite quote. And I'm sitting here going, these kids aren't gonna remember it. Well, what do they do? Snappy. They come back, they're sharing it with each other, they're sharing it. But that's awesome. So I mean, we, we have to help these kids and say, hey, it's not all bad, I don't need to break every phone that I see. Just a few of them, it's clear. Huh? So, I have an eighth grader. I'm, um, I'm in the trenches with you. And I've learned sometimes the hard way. I've been, in, you know, across the table from parents who, who just are really struggling, and, and, and my eighth grader will challenge me. So I think we need to monitor how much they're on. There's apps out there. I'm not a spokesperson for this app, but I know we have this at my daughter's. Meaning, you can go ahead and you can block any app that you want. You can set a schedule. Whatever time you think is appropriate, whether it's seven, eight, nine, ten, that's a parent's decision you get to decide. But you can say Monday through this day, it's off at eight. 
For years, I kept telling my parents, get Doc the phone. Right, Doc, get at the kitchen table at 7.30. Well, what time is it now? Quarter to 8, 8? I'm not home. I won't be home till 9 or 10, probably. I was awful as a parent. I was giving all this advice over the years, and it wasn't working for me. This works. Because in D.C., my daughter Kate had to go up to, to my wife and say, could you please extend the time tonight? You know, we have, we're on it. So, okay, Kate, we can. But again, I paid for the phone. I paid for the monthly bills. I have the password. It's my phone. I'm lending you the phone. I would gladly extend the time tonight. So again, I don't ever want to sound like I say you have to do it this way or this, but we have to communicate as parents. And we have to help each other. Because if you don't have a teenager right now, well, if yours is younger, you will. And you will want to sit with a group of parents but not be judgmental. Just have some discussions. And that's what we've shared our 20 years. And, and my, my kids are a little bit different. They don't miss what they've never had. I have a seventh and eighth grader, they're not on Snapchat. Okay, one's on Instagram, one's not. And, and she has to ask me for everything she posts and she just knows that as her reality. That's her reality. And, and, and the, the advice we give is hold, hold off and if you feel it's necessary, then there are other things here, but so key is what he said about being judgment free and about understanding that every family has to do it differently because of different situations. If what might work for some may work for others. So with that, our takeaways. We've already said it. We're not experts up here. Nobody really is the expert. The idea is to become the expert yourself about what your kid or what your student is doing with what they have and what times they're in it. And like he said, it's really okay. I go back to my Sheila Hatcher days, who was my mentor. And always he said it, if you're paying the bill, if you're doing whatever, yes, you should have their passwords. Yes, you can ask to see, to follow them in their accounts. I know my kids have been on sports teams and it's, it's not been allowed or one, it's been allowed, they've had to follow the coaches. It's a great tool. It's a great, it's a great use to know that we're in this together. So we will support you with setting those boundaries and, and setting structure. I think kids want that. I really do. Sometimes they're begging for it. It won't tell you that. Maybe I just convinced myself they really want that. Well, but again, it's not up to us to tell parents how to parent. And I think we have to be very careful about that. Because each family is going to be different and we have to respect that. But we do have to engage in the dialogue that said it is okay to put some structures on the. I mean, we're not giving the keys to the car to our 12 year old. But we are giving these devices in the hands of our fifth graders for the world at their exposure. I just think we gotta really think through that. And we have to support each other. Remember one of the best things, and I know we gotta wrap up here, one of the best things when you ask the group, how many of you have been to a camp or been down to vacation where you had to unplug? And, and, and a lot of them raised their hand and they said, how did you feel? And they were like, it felt great. It was wonderful. I really wish I had that on video. Because they, they talked about, they said, we got to, what happened? We got to know more students. We enjoyed it. Like, it, it is still, it's a stressor for a lot of our kids. It is, it is stressing them out with so many things, not just the social media, but to run home and check their grades. Like, I would have been off. I, I, I love taking a test and not seeing how I did for three days. It was awesome. So I am turning great. I'm turning my phone into the superintendent tonight and I'm done for a while, okay? So I hope parents support me with that. You won't be able to get a hold of me as easily maybe as you have, but um, we're going to just start that and see how that goes. <laughs> and I know the, the last thing is about balance. Just balance, right? We, we, I mean, we're not good at it. That's why, I mean, for us to talk about balance. Um, yeah. <laughs> don't fun. watch us for balance, but we try to balance our our time on this social media, our time, and um, you know, it's hard. And kids growing up, it's never been easy for kids to grow up. And yet I also think it's never been as exciting because learning can be exciting with this tech, but it also can be very scary. So we know how this impacts the emotional well-being of, of, of their development. So know that we are committed in the schools and we are trying our best on behalf of our kids. Certainly they're at the heart of it. And with that, I think Detective Higginson is, is heading on up. Well, hello, I'm Detective Wayne Higginson. I've been with the Lavonia Police Department for 27 years now. The last 12 years.
12 years, I've been with Michigan State Police Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. Uh, one of my also assignments in uh, 2013, I think, was to the FBI's Human Trafficking Task Force. That's another thing I do. Uh, I started out going online pretending to be you know, like a 13 year old girl and uh, having the predators talk to me instead of your kids. And after doing that for about six months, it became apparent that I could have a bigger impact uh, looking at the computers and the cell phones that the bad guys were using and getting them in front of judges that way. So I kind of transitioned. Um, what's kind of funny is over the years, things have changed. We talk about uh, current tactics and stuff with the predator. They no longer pretend to be kids. They'll uh, <laughs> they actually use the same social sites that our kids do. And they don't, they don't come on as themselves, as adults. And you ask, like, how does that work for them? Well, they're, they're looking for kids that are, are easily victimized, that are online because you know, things aren't working out for them, they feel like they're ostracized or what have you. And these guys you know, they're predators. They're going to target people who are vulnerable. And some things we can do as parents maybe to be aware is the packages start showing up at our houses, we can't play the shoes, and, you know, maybe a new cell phone. Odd items like that. That's kind of a key that something's going on that maybe they're being groomed by these people. Um, again, these guys will do weird things. Uh, they'll even go, uh, we've had uh, in the past, like the parks, a guy walking around with a leash, and he might be calling out for a, a pet name. And our kids, being the helpers, will you know, kind of curious what's going on. The person will tell them, hey, uh, I, I lost my dog. They responded. Kids calling their names. Why don't you walk over here with me and see if you can get my dog to respond? Well, we all know the person didn't have a dog. And these are things that have happened in the past where people will play on you know, the empathy of our kids to try and get them to you know, willingly go with them. Uh, another thing, this hasn't happened in our area, um, but we've been told that you know, people will show up when they've set up a meet, the kids think they're meeting another you know, 13, 14 year old. Carl Paul will be an older person in the car. And the person tell him, well, yes, so also has you know, practice right now, but they sent me over, you know, their grandmother or grandfather, they sent me over to come pick you up and take you over to the event that they're, they're cheerleading at. The kids were willing to get in the car with them. So, you know, just kind of the stranger danger and hitting on that with our kids, keeping them aware that, you know, if you don't know this person, you shouldn't be going with them, you shouldn't be talking to them. Um, Coming in contact with people over time doesn't make them not a stranger. Uh, we have people maybe set up like a lemonade stand or something with these new old days. And the uh, person comes by every day for seven or eight days and buys lemonade. And the kid, kid's going to feel more comfortable with that person because they've been around them several times. They're still a stranger. Same thing with the internet. These guys will, will talk to our kids over time and build up a relationship with them. And it's after they've been talking to them for months sometimes that that's when they start to start you know, turning the conversation into something else. So, you know, being aware of who your kids are friends with online, um, being aware that sometimes they might have multiple accounts. You know, there's the one that they show you, and then there's the one that they're really using. So be aware that they can do that kind of stuff. Um, when you get into high school ages, a lot of these apps and stuff they're talking about, especially the ones that deal with computers, Kids are a little more tech savvy. They actually know how to get around these programs, and, and they can boot the computer up into a different uh, operating system, and circumvent what you have. So nothing beats actually, you know, paying attention to what your kids are doing, having that computer in a common room. Um, kids to have computers up in a bedroom, a lot of times that could be a problem down the line, especially late at night. You don't know what they're doing. So with us, I had two high school age kids, and my last one was a senior. Um, so I'm almost through it, uh, but having that laptop down in the common room when they're doing their homework, spin the screen back so everybody in the room can see what they're doing, you know, it's helpful. And, and that way you know a little better what's going on in your own house. And then talking about, and moving on, talking about uh, how easy to find someone online. There are literally all kinds of free websites out there that you can get information about anybody. Um, you don't even have to pay to get it. So it's not any kind of a, a new thing in this day and age. I mean, pretty much everything is public information. Um, there's free websites out there. That you, you can find any public official, any person, and, and it's scary because that's all out there. And the one that charge money is a little more accurate. Um, but you still, you can find information on anyone. I'm 
line of data. So trying to limit your uh, online uh, footprint of uh, information about yourself, the only way you can try and do that is Google yourself once in a while, just to see what's out there. Um, I, I found like soccer sites when my kids were in middle school. They still have all the stuff out there from when I was coaching. And uh, you know, that stuff just never goes away. Okay, the, about your kids. We're all of our own worst enemies when it comes to posting things online. We don't think about you know, how much information we're sharing. But it doesn't take people getting too much information about you. We'll narrow down what area you live, what you're doing. I mean, the famous stories we hear where people are posting, can't wait to go on my big trip next week, come home and their house go into. Because <laughs> we're, we're putting that information out there to share with our friends, but it ends up being shared with more people. So you gotta be aware of uh, your, your online presence and things you're doing, which again, rolls right into what I heard earlier, so the, talk, the speakers were talking about, is uh, the lasting effects of our online choices. Everything we do is tracked. You can go and actually look up, like on Google, all the information they have about you. If you want to learn about that, you just have to Google it. So what's my Google account or information? They'll pop up a way to download all the information that they've stored about you over the years. And it's amazing what's there. But these lasting choices, it's not uncommon for an employer or a college or even someone who's just trying to find out more about you to be able to use the internet to learn all this stuff because we put it there for them to find. So you have to think about that, and it can be four years, 10 years. I mean, a lot of these uh, information gathering services are in their infancy. And so, you know, for them to go back four years and find something about you, that's not hard to do at all. But this stuff's going to literally last for a lifetime. And they're getting better and better at indexing all of us from the things we do. Uh, one of the <laughs> strangest things we're doing, we're testing this new, you know, the Google. Not the Alexa, but it was, it was one of those units where it, it sits in a room and you talk to it. I don't want to be device specific. But I got one and it came free for the a cell phone we got. And so out of curiosity, I wanted to be able to test it to see what kind of uh, information is stored on the device. So that let's say one was at a, a burglary scene in somebody's home and maybe it recorded the burglar's voice and them coming through the house so they'd be an investigating lead for us. So took it out of the box. Didn't authenticate it to my network or anything, plugged it into let it charge, and then went about my day at work, not thinking anything more about the device. And all our networks are password protected. But because we're in an old school building, some of the houses around us have open Wi Fi networks where you don't need a password. So I'm, I'm speculating that that's how this thing got access. We had a uh, state of Michigan employee come in to work on the computers for the state report writing system. And the guy started talking to me about this weird activity, you know, weird encounter he had with the Border Patrol because he likes to go over to Canada, buy used cars, bring them back, drive them five, six months to the United States, even sell them for more money than he bought them in Canada. And he thought that was a really sharp thing he was doing, he was basically driving cars for free. Well, the Google screen on my network computer changed the little advertising if you'd been searching yourself at web to buying cars in Canada. Like, how in the world did that thing figure out to associate with me what he was talking about? There was no speaker on my work computer. So that was a whole different network. So it, it obviously picked up what we were saying in the room and then associated it with me. So that got unplugged, back in the box, you know, I, I just point that thing around. But it's scary, but they're collecting on us. TVs are interconnected a lot of times now. Uh, you got your, your Microsoft, the uh, Xbox games. All these things have speakers on them and microphones, and they're listening to what we're doing. And I think we're all kidding ourselves. We don't think they're gathering information. It's not being directly used against us. It's trying to make our experience online more personal. So that when we do a search, the results we get are more useful for us. So I really do think they're doing you a service when they're collecting this information. But the story here, or what I want you to take away from this, is they are collecting information about you. So as our world becomes more and more connected, all of our information is going to be gathered in file files you know, going forth. It's just going to become better at it. Um, that's just the way our society is now, how connected it is. So getting that across to our kids kind of hard sometimes because their life expect you know, experiences are so much less than our again. So you know, remind them, the number one thing I get parents to call them trying to get stuff back. You know, kids send a message, 
to a friend, they include a picture. Now, like, they don't want that picture posted, so they want to you know, erase it from the internet. And, like, there is no erase button, but it's out there, it's out there. And uh, we, we have these things come back to haunt kids. You know, people they were friends with, and somebody shared a picture with them, and then, you know, two, three years later, that shows up on some website, and that picture was never meant to be public, let alone shared with anybody but that one person they sent it to. And so, you know, I'm always, when I do talks for the kids, I've always talked about, you know, you're embarrassed to show that picture to your mom or dad. You probably shouldn't be sharing it online. And hopefully people heed that, but, you know, that's a very common recurring call. I get that call from Hey, Nick Karen, saying a friend of us was looking at their son or daughter's phone and saw a picture of my kid that was inappropriate, and I want it gone. I want to take it back. And, you know, I have to grab it. So, I don't know. You know, we might be able to get that one picture taken down from that one place, but most likely it's been shared in a lot of places. So, um, most of the time kids are really good about this. The internet is a very powerful resource. You know, if our kids don't have the ability to use the internet, and, and understand its power, and that they're going to be at a huge disadvantage going into the work environment. So we do need for them to be aware of the internet and be really good at using it, but it also you know, respect that it can be very dangerous if it's used incorrectly. Uh, Cyberbullying is something that wasn't really mentioned, but it is a big thing where you know, kids will say stuff online they would never say to someone to their face. And if they did say it to their face, they get that immediate feedback of how it's heard from the other person, so you're given that opportunity to say they're sorry, or so that's not what I meant. So that's kind of the thing about the internet that's kind of a, uh, somewhat of a, a you know, weak point, is that you don't get that feedback you get in person. So, um, and again, that was such a, something somebody said a little earlier, so that, that was a good point, I wanted to emphasize that, because that was very really strong. Um, other than that, I'm gonna pass, I think this is it. Um, okay, thank you very much for coming. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Terry. I'm the Director of Student Services with Livonia Public Schools. We have heard so far this evening an overall presentation on school safety and just recently a presentation on social media and internet safety. And the reason why is because Livonia Public Schools cares about their children. We care about the social and emotional well-being of all the students that you entrust to us every single day in Livonia. So we have our student assistance providers and Jen Wilson, our elementary student assistance provider here to provide you with specific information about how we support our students on a daily basis. Danny? Thanks, Jen. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for coming. I know you've heard that a couple of times, but uh, we really do appreciate it. My name is Dennis Hines. I'm the student assistance provider at Stevenson. And you get a chance to meet um, some of my colleagues in just a moment. I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about what the student assistance program is. And before I do that, I just wanted to say how, um, how fortunate Livonia Public Schools is to have an, an SAP program. There aren't a lot of districts that have it. Um, and I just, I'm not going to say this because my bosses are here, but I am very grateful to the LPS administration and the Board of Education for maintaining the SAP program over the years. Um, it's gone by the wayside in a number of districts, and, and uh, the one public schools has stayed strong, and I'm really grateful for that, and I think all of us are. Um, the SAP program is basically designed to provide uh, emotional and mental health support for kids that are um, in crisis or they're, they have issues that are ongoing that put them at risk for failure in school um, and lack of fulfillment, lack of happiness in life. And the support and the help that we provide can kind of come in four different ways. That's how I like to look at it. We provide uh, support to students one-on-one, -on -one, and we see kids uh, for a variety of different issues. It could be mood management stuff, family issues. Um, it could be peer issues, um, having difficulty with uh, learning and, and being successful in the classroom, uh, all kinds of different things. I think one of the things that I love about my job is the variety. Uh, we see kids in groups. We do a variety of different support groups. Uh, again, 
again, uh, with a wide range of uh, topics, family issues, grief and loss, school survival, school success, those kinds of things. We also do a lot of uh, referral work where uh, if an issue comes up that a student or a family has that the school can't exactly address that issue or it isn't the best place to address it, we have pretty good relationships with providers in the community, so then our, our goal is to provide them with the best available help out in the community, be it an individual therapist or an agency. Um, we also do a lot of what I call consultation. We'll, we'll meet with parents, we'll meet with staff, we'll talk about uh, what's going on with a student and what the best possible way uh, to address those individual needs, what, what the best ways might be. Um, to highlight uh, one particular uh, thing that we did uh, last year, Emily Gossel is going to come up and, and highlight uh, our SAP website that we're kind of proud of. So, Emily. Thank you, Denny. Um, I am Emily Goslow. I am the student assistance provider at Franklin High School. And as Debbie mentioned, we are very fortunate that at the secondary level, the high schools were now full time, which is wonderful. Um, so, I wanted to do a quick PSA about our website that we're very proud of. So, please check this out. It is on every um, school's at least at the secondary level, um, everybody's homepage and it links to the student assistance program. So on this first tab, it really just describes kind of what Denny already talked about, what is the student assistance program, and then how to get in contact with us. So here's our information. Um, here is the tab for parenting support and teen issues. And so we have some general uh, websites that we found that were very helpful. Um, and then also, Denny has created over the years a number of PowerPoints that we thought would be helpful, you know, parenting tips, things like that. And then further down, we also have uh, parenting the difficult teen. So that might be if a student is acting out, um, showing some behaviors that are concerning, what are some resources available to you? Uh, we have um, the social media, it really links to the LPS district website, and I'm thinking we should also load this PowerPoint onto this so that you have another way to access this information. We have some mental health resources, uh, substance abuse um, resources, and each of these, click and either go to a link, a website, or an article that you can download. Um, so that has some wonderful information. Want you to know about community resources, because um, we're here to support, obviously, at school, but also families who need additional resources. And knowing that um, our county has so many wonderful resources, uh, take a look at that section. For counseling, as Denny mentioned, it's really preferable to talk one-on-one -on -one to your SAP because we can best match um, kind of what's going on, the presenting issue with the service provider. Um, and we're also, this is a live document, a live website, so we're going to try and keep it updated. Um, but we found this, for example, some common myths about therapy that we thought would be helpful for people to take a look at some of the barriers to getting support. Um, and then, you know, just general hotlines and then upcoming events. So, for example, tonight's um, event was on here. So, we really hope that you take a look at this. Um, there's some really valuable information. Thank you. So next we're going to hear from Lisa Wilson, and she's at Churchill. Thanks, Emily. Thank you so much for being here. We really do love your, ki your kids so much, and we love our families. Um, as Denny and Emily have said, the student assistance programs in each school provide prevention services, and we're also part of the multidisciplinary guidance group in the Livonia Public Schools, which provides educational interventions and referral help to students and parents. It's a specific one-on-one, um, one-family -on -one, one, one family type of um, intervention that we work on together. So working with the SAPs, the school psychologists, social workers, counselors, special education department chairs, administrators, teachers, and others meet to coordinate these services when they're needed. We meet usually on a weekly basis. Um, each team, um, we call this the 
educational planning team. Each school has an educational planning team that coordinates supports for individual students. And um, these supports the service layers professional, educationally spe specialized disciplines to problem solve and recommend a plan of action when issues arise. These recommendations can include developing plans for increased academic success, structuring support plans, and or mitigating disabilities to provide access to educational opportunities. Our goal is to provide connection to strategies and services and when needed community referrals in order to increase the student's ability to achieve at school. And now I'm going to hand it over to an elementary SAP, Jennifer Wilson. Thank you. Um, my name is Jen Wilson, and I am one of the elementary support teachers known as the EST at Randolph Elementary this year. And after sitting here tonight, I realized that my job is way more important than when I first got here. My job is to help all the kindergarten through fourth grade little babies learn how to progress through our K-12 district. Um, one of my main roles is to work with students um, on learning just how to get along with others, learning how to deal with stresses in their lives, learning how to get through um, emotional difficulties that they may be um, enduring each day. I work with teachers, parents, and the students. I work in small groups, and I work one-on-one. -on -one. My job is to um, determine intervention plans, uh, create behavior plans with parents, and help de-escalate behavior when needed. Um, I've also facilitated some coping skill groups with our social workers, as well as our um, ESAPs, teaching children how to um, deal with their frustrations, and what does it look like when you're frustrated. Um, I think on a daily basis, I say to my students, in the elementary school, we're allowed to make mistakes. We're allowed to get angry. We're allowed to cry. Um, we really need to learn what to do with that and how to make it right. So each day, I, you know, I enjoy the variety and I enjoy helping kids become successful with normal emotions that we all have as adults. Um, I'm also able to help on a daily basis by just being that safe person for your child. Um, they come to me when they're upset, they come to calm down, and they, calm, they come to me just for having someone to listen. I am a huge advocate for building relationships with students. Um, if kids feel like they can count on me and they're safe by feeling upset or frustrated, I just listen and help them get through it. Um, I've also found how successful it is working with families um, just to ensure the best possible school experience. You know, I learn from parents and parents learn from me. When we work together and we're consistent for children, you know, they're more successful and they love school and they're able to learn, especially when they feel safe. Um, another resource that we have as the social and emotional EST is I'm able to offer breaks for students throughout the day. Breaks can include reward breaks for making good choices, um, completing their work, not distracting the learning of others. Um, students come to me just to reset their mornings and say, you know what, I'm having a bad morning. I had a bad morning, I forgot this and this and they're just being able to be heard and move on with their day. I have students that take sensory breaks. They're just having a sensory overload or, you know, there was a lot going on in the morning and something upset them on the bus and they just need to have a sensory break. We have little, um, you know, things they can squeeze, little water bottles they can shake and they can learn how to self calm themselves down, which is just a, such a great skill for, you know, being an adult and going to high school. Um, some other intervention plans are some check-in, check-outs. There's some students that come to school and, you know, they're still tired and they're still hungry and they just need someone that will listen to them again and, you know, give them a plan of what their day will look like. A lot of kids don't like that unexpected, um, you know, not sure what's going to happen. So I'm able to sit down with them one-on-one -on -one and say, this is what's going to happen today. You can do it. Do you have any worries? Do you have any concerns? And once we get through that, they move on with their day. At the end of the day, we kind of debrief, and it's extremely successful. I mean, in all honesty, I'm a mom of three boys as well in Pony Public Schools. And there's, once a week, I'm tearing up. I'm just kids being so proud of themselves and having that success and um, just being proud and using the strategies that they've learned. So that's very exciting. And I also have um, some students that aren't able to complete 
work at home or in class, and they just come down, they call it my study hall, they kind of gave it that name, but it's just a quiet place where they don't have the distractions, they can take their tests, they can finish their homework from the night before, and again, that makes them feel successful. So that's about it, and they may look different in every school and every classroom, but you know, each support is catered to the need of um, each student. So that's what it looks like in the K-4. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Tina. Well, that concludes our formal presentation. I want to apologize for going over a bit, um, but I hope you'll agree with me that the information shared um, hopefully was extremely valuable to you um, and will be helpful to you and your family. While I invite our board president to come up for a, a closing remark, I want to introduce our cabinet team. And I, with the light shining, I'm not sure where everyone is, but I want to be able to make sure that you know who they are. One to acknowledge the tremendous work that they do in help leading many of these initiatives, but also they will be here if you have any questions. So I'm gonna start on the left. I think we have Dr. Jennifer Ontario, our Director of Student Services, Mr. Dan Willenberg, our Director of Secondary, who oversees all of our middle and high school programs and staff. Teresa O'Brien is our Chief Academic Officer in charge of all of our curriculum and learning. Allison Smith, our uh, Director of Finance. This is Cindy Scott, our Director of Elementary, oversees all of our K-4 and 5-6 schools and programs. Mr. Phil Francis, who is our Director of Operations, and Mr. Keith McDonald, our uh, Director of Human Resources. So our team will be here. We're happy to stay after and answer questions that you have, but we want to invite uh, President Johnson to come up. So while you are pulling out your ticket so we can give away some fantastic door prizes for you and your family, I invite President Johnson to uh, close out the evening. Thank you, Mrs. Elkquist. Uh, on behalf of the board, uh, Vice President uh, Burton, and we also had another board member come in during the evening, Crystal Frank. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, boy, we really heard a lot of important information tonight. Uh, thank you to all of our presenters uh, for being willing to come out and spend some time with us. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do this without the support of uh, Superintendent Oakwist and the cabinet and the administration and the school board. Early on, we saw a lot of information about uh, the implementation of new measures that had been put into many of our schools. That was uh, basically through the bond that our community was so generous in passing five years ago. That was the brainchild of our former superintendent, Dr. Leopa. Thank you so much for leading that charge uh, to get us to where we are today. And I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, it's, it's very, very important to us to maintain the safety of our children. We're here to educate, but you can't educate unless they're safe, unless they feel safe in our schools. So we appreciate you coming out. Thank you very much, and uh, Mrs. Lucas. Thanks, President Johnson. All right, so again, once again, thank you so much to our presenters, um, to our community partners, and to all of you.